Hi guys, I was just going to my kitchen to get a drink and I noticed I happen to have 1.1 billion year old stromatolite fossils in my house. And that's what I have right here. This, um, this is what's left of those cyanobacteria that I talked about um, uh, that were very, very common in uh, the Precambrian. And in this fossil you can even see the layers that developed as, um, as these cyanobacteria were growing and uh, sediment and stuff would get captured in there. So uh, I just thought I'd take a little diversion from lecture and show you these 1.1 billion year old stromatolite fossils. But now we should really get back to uh, our Paleozoic lecture and uh, figure out where, uh, where we left off. Um, okay, we're at brachiopods. Uh, brachiopods are, uh, if you look at how long they've lived, a relatively successful um, uh, group of organisms because they show up in the Cambrian and some species of brachiopods um, still exist today. They're not as abundant as they once were, but uh, there are still some species around. They have two uh, valves. And when we talk about valves, we're talking about shells. So there's two shells that come together. Uh, but they are different in their anatomy from, say, uh, bivalves, clams. So a completely different phylum from, uh, from your, uh, the, the clams you might see today on, uh, in the ocean. Now, they have what's called bilateral symmetry. That means we can cut them in half, and uh, they're a mirror image. And the bilateral sym symmetry is across the valves. Um, the dorsal and ventral valve, the, the two shells, are not symmetric. Now, most brachiopods are made from calcite. That's the shell is made from calcite. Uh, the larva is vagrant, moves around, but the adults are benthic. So this is our basic brachiopod. And notice, like I said, there's our two shells, and those two shells are not symmetric. However, if we look down on this brachiopod, we could cut it in half right there, and that's the bilateral symmetry. It's across the shell. And when this thing is in its life position, it has this thing called a pedicle that secures it to, uh, to the sea floor. And then there's the two shells and would open and close those shells depending uh, whether it was uh, trying to eat or not. There's two types of uh, brachiopods. You have the inarticulate brachiopods that couldn't talk at all. And, no, okay. Bad joke, sorry. Inarticulate uh, brachiopods, the valves, the two shells, are held together with a muscle. And they show up in the Cambrian, diversify in the Ordovician, and then they start declining. The articulate brachiopods, the shells are held together with a hinge. And they also show up in the Cambrian, and diversify in the Ordovician, and they become really, really abundant until the end of the Permian. At the end of the Permian, brachiopods are very hard hit by an extinction event. So when we talk about um, the articulate brachiopods, see they have uh, what's well, called teeth, like the, uh, the, the teeth of a socket that then fit into the socket there. And so it's almost like some of our, our bones where there's kind of a, a knob that fits into a socket. And that's what held the articulate brachiopod shells together. Mollusks are a very diverse phylum. There's all kinds of different mollusks that exist in the Paleozoic and all kinds of different mollusks that still exist today. And um, in this phylum, we have everything from snails and clams and octopus and squid and these things called chitons. We have all kinds of organisms. And even though they look very different, like octopus and snails don't look much alike at all, uh, all of them have a similar internal structure. So when we start looking at their anatomy and their organ systems, that is the similarity that ties them all together into a single phylum. 
Now, these guys have relatively complex um, organ systems. They have sensory uh, uh, systems, digestive, circulatory organs. Um, marine forms have gills. There are both marine forms of this and uh, terrestrial ones. And let's just see how diverse mollusks, mollusks can be. Uh, we have the placophorans, which have numerous paired gills, and they existed in the Cambrian, they show up, and they still exist today, but these guys have never been that common. They've always been one of those fossils, one of those organisms that's there, but we didn't really see, like, when placophorums ruled the earth. They, they just never were common. Now there's monoplacophorans. They have this single kind of cone-shaped shell there. And um, originally, they were thought to only exist from the Cambrian to the Devonian. In fact, when I took paleontology, we were like, Cambrian to Devonian. Uh, but uh, then some studies that were done um, found that they still live in deep sea trenches. So these guys still exist today, just in, um, in some... Uh, uh, interesting, hard to get to environments. Um, their morphology, when you study it, shows that they probably had a segmented worm ancestor. Now, Pelesipoda, which is also known as bivalvia, this includes uh, some of the tasty uh, mollusks that exist, uh, like clams, mussels, scallops, oysters. You know, that's uh, one thing you'll find out when I uh, when I study paleontology. Uh, most organisms, when I when I study them, I, I either want to eat it, I want to ride it, or I want one as a pet. And these are the tasty ones. Uh, these guys live from the Cambrian and still exist today, and they become really abundant in the Carboniferous. So in the early Paleozoic, yeah, there would be some of these guys around, but um, they wouldn't be uh, large numbers of them until that Carboniferous time period. Like brachiopods, these guys have two shells. They have two valves. But the symmetry is different from the brachiopods. Right, this is the brachiopod symmetry, where we go across the shells, and the two shells are not symmetric to each other. In a bivalve, the two shells are symmetric to each other, but if we cut it across the shell, then it is not symmetric. So, for um, test number three, make sure you know how to tell the difference between a brachiopod and a bivalve, the pelecipod. Gastropods, snails, are another um, important group in, within the mollusks. They show up in the Cambrian and we still have them today. And these are just showing you some of the varied um, shapes that uh, uh, these snail shells can take. And these guys are um, quite successful in many different environments. We have marine snails, we have freshwater ones, and we have terrestrial ones as well. And uh, they become quite diverse in the Pennsylvanian. And uh, the earliest terrestrial, basically air-breathing snails that we see are all the way back in the Devonian. All right, cephalopods. Cephalopods, again, we have them from the Cambrian, still exist today. They become common in the Ordovician and really, really diversify in the Silurian. These guys are very complex for invertebrates. Um, if they have a shell, not all of these guys have shells, but if they have shells, they are chambered into camera separated by septae. And uh, in paleontology, when we talk about camera, camera is simply a chamber, a box. That's actually where the name for camera, like taking pictures, comes from, because the earliest cameras were just a box. And so if you see that term in paleontology, it's usually like a box or a, a chamber that an organism lives in. And um, the septae that separate these chambers form sutures. And these are used to classify ammonites. And ammonites are really important index fossils, especially once we reach the Mesozoic. So here's our ammonite. 
and um, there you can see its shell. There's those different camera, those different chambers, and here's where the organism would live. And it has a complex eye, it has a mouth, it has gills, it's a, quite a complex organism. And uh, here we have uh, my pet ammonite, where we have this shell that's right here. Here's the organism. Like I said, these guys have complex eyes, and uh, like an octopus, because they're related to them, they have a bunch of little tentacles too. Now, oh, like I said, ammonites are good index fossils. And one of the things that we look at to tell the difference between different ammonites and when they existed are their sutures. And um, so we have the simplest sutures um, are nautiloid. Then they get a little more complex. That's the goniatitic. Then we have the serotitic is a little more complex. And then the ammonitic is the most complex. And you can see this is Devonian to Permian. This is Permian to Triassic. And that's Jurassic and Cretaceous. Interestingly, the only one of these shelled cephalopods like this that live, uh, that still live today are nautiloids. The chambered nautilus uh, is still with us. The rest of these guys went extinct um, when the dinosaurs went extinct. All right, how are we doing on time? Okay, arthropods, another very diverse a uh, group of organisms are arthropods, and they have an exterior skeleton of chitin, and they have jointed appendages. These guys have a, a well-developed nervous system and sensory organs, and um, uh, have all kinds of different complex forms. And one very, very common uh, type of uh, organism uh, or that belongs to arthropods are trilobites. Now we have both swimming trilobites and ones that lived on the sea floor. And they live from the Cambrian to the Permian. They go extinct at the end of the Permian. And these guys also were probably descended, they evolved from segmented worms. Um, they are the state fossil of Wisconsin and um, they were really, really abundant in the Cambrian. Um, and while they exist through the rest of the um, Paleozoic, their, their major time period of uh, like ruling the world was the Cambrian. Um, and so they declined at the end of the Cambrian, they decline again at the end of the Devonian, and they kind of hang on until the Permian when they, um, when they end up going extinct. So why are these things called trilobites? They're called trilobites. All right, they're called trilobites because they have three lobes. They have this central lobe called the axial lobe, and then they have plural lobes, these two lobes to the side. And these trilobites, um, these can be, uh, they come in various shapes and some have extra spines growing on them, probably to uh, help against predation. They have eyes, complex eyes, very similar to what you'd see on a, uh, like a, a housefly or bumblebee. And like I said, some of these guys would swim and some of them would crawl on the, uh, on the sea floor. Now, when we look at our trilobites, like I said, they have that axial lobe and then the plural lobe, so three lobes. But we can also look at their morphology like this. They have a cephalon, that's where their eyes are. Then they have the thorax, and then they have this thing called the pygidium, which is the trilobut. I always wonder what trilobites would taste like. Because trilobites, I mean, maybe they taste like lobster or something. All right, our next organism that we're going to go over is something called a sea scorpion or a eurypterid. This is a eurypterid, and you can tell why uh, that it looks kind of like a, a scorpion. 
Um, you know, it has uh, it has like a pokey little tail here, and it has um, it has swimming arms, and then it has uh, pinchers and stuff. Um, and these Eurypterids have five pairs of legs, pinchers, and like I said, a tail spine. And these things were major predators, and they could be up to three meters long. So imagine swimming in the ocean with one of these guys who's three meters and isn't nearly as fluffy and cuddly as this thing is. Um, <laughs> these guys exist from the Ordovician to the Permian, but they're really, really abundant in the Silurian and Devonian. And these guys uh, probably lived in brackish water, so not necessarily the saltiest of water, but also not fresh water. And we know they could survive on land for short intervals because we have actually found trackways of these guys um, in Scotland. Uh, somewhere in central Scotland, there's uh, some trackways where these guys walked over kind of a muddy tidal flat. So we know they could walk around on land for a short period of time. And during, uh, when these guys were around, when they were extant, they were one of the top predators. And there's a, a real um, a diagram showing these guys with their, um, uh, their swimming legs, their compound eyes, their, their spine here. This is looking down on one, and this is looking at its belly right there. And uh, this is an artist's rendition of a uh, sea scorpion attacking a prey animal. And some of them did have very, very sharp spines on their tails, and it's thought they might have used that tail as, uh, as a weapon to help them uh, kill their prey. All right, um, let's look at some arthropods that weren't in the oceans. So some non-marine um, arthropods. Um, in the Silurian, we get centipedes and millipedes. In the Devonian, we get mites and spiders. In the Carboniferous, we start getting winged insects. Now, more primitive winged insects can't fold their wings up. So there would be like dragonflies. You know, dragonflies can't fold their wings. So the earliest insects that were winged couldn't fold their wings up. That develops a little bit later on in evolution. Now, in the Carboniferous, this is a, um, a dragonfly uh, that would have existed in, in the Carboniferous, and you can compare how big that thing would be to, um, to a six-foot uh, tall person. Yes, these organisms got bigger in the, um, in the Carboniferous because oxygen levels were much higher at that time. So a time when we had vast forests uh, giving off a whole lot of oxygen. And um, because of the way uh, these arthropods, these insects, absorb oxygen, when there is more of it in the um, atmosphere, they can grow larger. And so if you uh, ha uh, lived in the, um, in the Carboniferous, you would uh, I not need a fly swatter for this. You'd probably need your shotgun for that, right? Uh, because you had dragonflies that size. You had centipedes and millipedes that were a few meters long. You had giant spiders like in Lord of the Rings. You had all kinds of stuff like that. So a kind of dermata, this phylum, um, this is another interesting phylum. It has five-fold symmetry, spiny skin. In fact, echinodermata refers, uh, dermata refers to skin, and the echino refers to spiky or spiny. Uh, and they all have a water vascular system. These guys are benthic marine. They live on the seafloor, and they're very distantly related to chordates. Remember, chordates are organisms with a backbone, like us. And you guys are familiar with uh, some types of uh, these echinoderms, like these um, starfish. Starfish belong to a group called Asteroidea. They uh, show up in the Ordovician, and obviously we still have these today. Another type of echinoderm uh, are the Echinoidea, which are sea urchins and sand dollars. And these also show up in the Ordovician to present. 
these guys, like, they're the bane of my existence when I'm in Hawaii because invariably I always step on one of these buggers. Another uh, very important member of Echinodermata, at least as far as paleontology goes, is Crinoidea, crinoids. And they might have shown up in the Cambrian. That's why I have a question mark there. It's like maybe they existed then. They do still exist today, although they're not nearly as abundant as they once were. In lab, you saw some of these uh, columns of the crinoid. So basically, the crinoid has a hold fast that holds it to the sea floor. Then it has these columns, this spine or that goes up there to what's called a calyx. And in the calyx, that's where the mouth and the digestive system and all that part of the uh, animal is. And then it has these, these like little arms that help it in its filter feeding. And these guys would live on the sea floor and they kind of, you know, move around. Right? And as they're moving around, they'd be capturing some food and bringing it to, um, to their, um, their mouth there. Similar to the crinoids are blastoids, except they don't have the nice arms. But there would be this. You saw one of these in the fossil lab. They have this. There's their mouth. And they have basically these, um, uh, this, this stalk uh, that holds it to the uh, bottom. These guys live from the Silurian to the Permian. So just think of blastoids as like these nice crinoids without the, uh, the arms uh, that existed there. And we're going to end there and pick up more in volume three.